In the past few months, inflation in the UK has halved from 10 to 5%. But ask an average shopper, and they may express scepticism. The cost of living seems to be rising faster. In 2021, Jordan Peterson tweeted that he believed inflation was 15%, almost double the official inflation figure. And he's not alone. Surveys suggest nearly a third of consumers are skeptical about government inflation data. Why do some pundits believe that inflation is higher than official data? And are these analyses correct? Now, firstly, governments can intervene in inflation data. In the early 2000s, Argentina had about a 40% inflation. The government introduced price controls, but unfortunately they didn't work. So to fix the problem of perennially high inflation, the government fired the statisticians in charge of inflation and produced their own. And miraculously, inflation started to fall. For a time, it became illegal in Argentina to publish data different to the government's official inflation figures. However, nobody was fooled. Citizens in Argentina could easily see what was happening to prices. And also private economists abroad developed alternative measures of inflation. For example, implying inflation from a fall in the currency. Now the UK and the US have independent statistics agencies, and here the claims are different. But why can people believe that inflation is much higher than official methods? Firstly, in recent years, we've had prices rising faster than wages, causing an unexpected fall in real incomes. And so we notice any price increases much more. But where did that claim of 15% inflation come from? In the 1980s, the US changed its methodology of calculating inflation. The ONS in the UK made similar changes. John Williams, who runs Shadow Stats, claimed that if we'd used this old methodology of calculating inflation, the real inflation rate would be much higher than the official method. Now, the Bureau of Labour did produce a report saying that if they had used the old measures of calculating inflation, official inflation would be higher, but only by about 0.4% a year, nothing like the 6% a year that the shadow stat claimed. Why did the government change the way we calculate inflation? Well, there were many small changes, but let me give you one example. If we take a TV, we're constantly measuring a different product. In 1980, the average TV was small, low res, black and white, and might take a few minutes to warm up. A TV we buy in 2023 is much more expensive, but almost a different product. 4K, 48 inch, flat screen, etc. Therefore, if TVs increase in price, we have to adjust for the fact that it's a different quality, almost a different product. My first mobile phone that I bought in 2000, a Nokia cost around 40 pounds. The last mobile phone I bought, an iPhone 14, cost £500. But we wouldn't say that we've had inflation of 1,000%. Buying an iPhone means I don't need to buy a camera, I don't need to buy film, I don't need a video recorder, a calculator, alarm clock. So inflation is a measure of a cost of living. But if a more expensive iPhone means we don't need to buy all these other products, this has to be taken into account. The problem with shadow stats is that they are not actually calculating using the old methodology, which would be incredibly difficult. They are just using a fudge factor, which pushes up inflation by around 5 or 6%. According to shadow stats, it would mean we had an average inflation rate of 9% since 2000, and prices should have risen sixfold. Has anything increased 600% since 2000? Perhaps tuition fees in the UK, but generally not. But I do think that an appeal of shadow stats is partly related to the huge appetite for extremely negative economic data. I always say that the perfect YouTube title is something like, things are much worse than what they are telling you. And by the way, if you are interested in more dire economic stats, which show we're in the midst of a Great Depression with runaway inflation, a subscription to Shadow Stats only costs $175. Interestingly, it's been that price for the past 17 years. So at least one good is avoiding inflation. Nevertheless, the fact that people consider inflation is higher than the official figures is still interesting and worth uh, going into more detail. Last August, I went to New York and a big topic of conversation was inflation. Why? Well, because it seemed like everything had doubled in price, especially food. Last time I was there, 
I could go for breakfast in a New York diner and get a nice breakfast for a $10 bill. Now you need a $20 bill and you don't get much change. And I remember discussing uh, the cost of soaring food prices. And at one point in the conversation, I wondered, shall I mention that the Federal Reserve's preferred method of inflation, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, is currently about 2.5%. Now, fortunately, I have some social skills and I kept quiet. I joined in the general complaint about how expensive food was. Now, there's an important thing to be aware of here. CPI measures inflation over the past 12 months. But as individuals, we measure inflation over a longer time period. We tend to remember prices from two or three years ago. Therefore, it's understandable that we don't place too much emphasis on official inflation figures of 2% when we can't afford to eat out like we used to be able to. An interesting observation is that in America, people are very pessimistic about the economy, despite theoretically good economic data, low inflation, high growth, low unemployment, rising employment levels. Now, partly this is partisan and negative media coverage. Republicans are much more likely to believe the economy is doing badly. But also, there's a psychological element because prices are still significantly higher than they were two or three years ago. And it was a real psychological shock that we had this burst of inflation after a few decades of very low inflation. Now, another example of why people can feel inflation is higher than the official figure is that your personal inflation rate can literally be higher. For example, the poorest groups in society will tend to pay a higher percentage of their income on basic necessities like food and energy, and a smaller share on luxury items like electronics. In 2022, we saw food inflation running at 20% and energy inflation running at 50%. Therefore, the poorest groups in society were experiencing a higher inflation rate than the average person. And this is confirmed by ONS data, which shows the poorest had a higher inflation rate than the richest and the average person. And this matters a lot because if your benefits are linked to inflation, say 10%, but your personal inflation rate is 15%, you're effectively becoming worse off in real terms. At the moment, due to higher interest rates, it's homeowners with mortgages who are experiencing a higher inflation rate. It's ironic that using interest rates to reduce inflation is actually causing some inflation itself. Another complicated factor in measuring inflation is that there are many different ways of measuring it. The UK alone has several official methods, CPI, CPIH, RPI. If it all sounds confusing, don't worry, you're in good company. To simplify all this, we can concentrate on two. The headline rate, which measures all the major prices in the economy, and the underlying or core inflation rate, which tries to exclude the more volatile prices like energy and food. For example, in the UK, headline inflation rose to over 10% because of volatile factors like oil prices and food prices. But underlying inflation was not quite as bad. But now with lower oil prices and lower gas prices, the headline rate has fallen to 4.7%. But the underlying inflation pressures are still there. This is why we have to be careful about placing too much emphasis on the headline measure. In the UK, services inflation is running at around 7%, a reflection of higher nominal wages. And this will be a concern to the Bank of England because it's hard to reduce this kind of uh, nominal wage inflation. It doesn't mean the government have been lying to you, but you do have to be careful about choosing a particular method of inflation to prove a particular point. Another quick question. When teaching inflation, I will ask students what happened to prices between January and October of this year? The correct answer is that prices rose at a slightly slower rate. But many students will fall into the trap of saying that prices fell. So this year, the UK Prime Minister had a target to reduce inflation from 10 to 5%, and this was achieved. But it's very unlikely to lead to a feel-good factor, because prices are still very high, and they're still rising. Now, why is this important? Well, politicians may talk about halving inflation, but a consumer thinks, I see prices keep going up. Now, both are actually right, but it is easy to understand why there's a divergence in views about inflation. 
Another form of inflation that has crept in in recent years is shadow inflation or shrinkflation. The government measure changes in the price of goods. But what happens if a company keeps prices the same but shrinks the size of a product, makes smaller chocolate bars? If you have a target weight of chocolate to eat, which is a very good uh, ideal to have, you would have to spend 10% more to get the same amount of a good, even though the price is the same. And this has become much more prevalent since the recent burst of inflation. Now, the ONS do say that they try to account for changes in weight. If a weight decreases, then this is adjusted in the calculation of inflation. Another quick thing is that recently I was in the supermarket and I was really shocked to see that olive oil was selling at £7 a bottle. I'm sure I remember spending £2 on a bottle of olive oil in recent years. Olive oil inflation is actually running at 50% and may go up even more. And this is contributing to CPI inflation. Not a huge amount because it's a small good, but I responded by not buying any olive oil. There's a psychological block to spending seven pounds on olive oil. And I can easily use a substitute like coconut oil or no oil at all. So although prices are going up, I'm not actually paying them. And this is the difference between CPI and the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. The PCE measures what people actually buy. Post-COVID, lettuces in America soared to like $6 a lettuce. But who spends $6 on a lettuce? So although inflation was very high, people weren't actually buying some of these goods. And this can actually cause inflation, your personal inflation, to be lower than the official method, at least in this area. Now, an important thing to bear in mind is that if you don't trust government data, others are available. The Billion Price Index was a breakthrough for measuring inflation independently of the government, looking at a whole range of prices online, very easy to do these days. Price Stats measures prices in real time and has proved to be a very good guide to future inflation. It doesn't have the delays of government measures. The motivation is that investors want to have their own inflation rate. They want to have better future guidance on markets and interest rate decisions. They have no motivation to under-report inflation. And you can see how price that data is ac accurately predicting future inflation trends. So are the governments lying to you about inflation? No, but inflation data can be tricky. A fall in the headline inflation rate to 2% is only part of the story. Inflation measures the cost of living and for, and for consumers and average person, the cost of living is much more than just the recent inflation data. But looking at this inflation and shadow stats in particular made me remember a video I made last year about why YouTube pushes videos about very negative economic news. And it explains why titles like They Are Lying To You can be so successful. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. See you soon.